Today is June 30th, 2010. I am Karen Aronson. We are speaking with Richard K. Lester, a professor of nuclear science and engineering and head of that department. He is also the director of the MIT Industrial Performance Center, an MIT-wide research unit based in the School of Engineering. Richard, thank you for talking to us. You recently joined MIT's provost, Raphael Reif, on a visit to Russia. What was the purpose of that trip, and what did you do there? The president of Russia, President Medvedev, um, fairly recently announced that Russia's economy was no longer going to be depend as dependent as it had been on oil and gas. Uh, and that it was going to become more modern and depend more heavily on innovation, as we understand that word. And um, having made that statement, um, his cabinet sort of jumped to attention and said, well, we better figure out what that means. And several months ago, en masse, the Russian cabinet, or at least the economic part of it, arrived at MIT on a fact-finding mission to figure out how to do innovation. And uh, they came almost entirely unannounced. As a matter of fact, Susan Hockfield wasn't even here. Uh, and uh, she was in Singapore, I think, that, uh, on that, that, those couple of days. But a seminar, basically, was organized for them. And uh, I spoke to them and several others, too. And out of that, uh, there grew a number of conversations um, around the possibility of establishing outside Moscow a Silicon Valley-like region uh, in an area called Skolkovo. And the government, the Russian government, uh, is asking a number of Western institutions for help uh, in creating such a place. Uh, in Russia, including MIT, and they invited a group of MIT people over, I think probably seven or eight of us uh, went, um, for an extraordinary week of um, discussions with many of their university uh, people and the Academy of Sciences and some of their business people to explore whether MIT could a, do something useful and constructive, and B, whether we would want to do something of that kind uh, in Russia. So we had a, our own fact-finding mission um, over a period of a week with Raphael and, and a number of others. Has anything been decided yet? Well, yes. Uh, an agreement was signed, uh, as, it, as it turned out, the week after our visit, uh, Medvedev came to, in fact, Last week, Medvedev came to um, to Washington, met with Obama, and uh, around that meeting, we, that is MIT, signed an agreement with um, a Russian entity uh, called the Skolkovo Foundation, which is responsible for developing this uh, initiative. And the agreement calls for MIT to spend the next six months or so uh, investigating or exploring whether a longer term uh, engagement would with the Russians would be would be worthwhile and and uh, would be a sort of a productive and constructive thing to do so that agreement was signed last week do you really think one could grow a place like that. Uh, we used to have new towns in, in America. They were we kind of architectural phenomena. We did have new towns. And actually, the Russians have made something of a practice of this in, in, in Soviet times. They created um, science cities of various kinds dotted around. In fact, we visited one while we were in Russia, in Novosibirsk, um, uh, in Siberia. and. Um, there's a, an adjacent town called Akademi Gorod or something of that kind, which is a science city. So they actually, they've done that before. And whether it's an appropriate thing to do in a global economy in which, you know, what really matters more than anything else is your connections with the rest of the, 
of the world, um, you know, how that will work is, a, I think, one of the big questions that we will want to think about, and I'm sure they will need to think about as they as they consider this. If it's doable there, uh, if they've done it, why are they coming to the U.S. for for help? Well, is what they've done, it's a way? very different. I mean, what they've done in the past is a science city, and these science cities were literally isolated from the rest of the country. Um, I don't know that you could easily get in and out of them even um, for security reasons. But what they, I think, do understand is that to create an innovation region or sort of a, it, it, it can't be like that at all. It has to be open and, and, um, and for that reason they identified a location just outside Moscow. Um, which traffic permitting, and one of the things we discovered was the horrendous, horrendous traffic <laughs> jams in Moscow and Petersburg. But um, the idea is to make it accessible to Western innovators, Western companies, Western venture capitalists, um, and to make it something that is integrated with the global economy. And of course, that's something they've never done before. How long do you think it would take to do it, and do you think it's truly feasible? What are the ingredients? You know, people, of course, around the world, countries and, and cities and regions around the world are all looking for the sort of magic source of Silicon Valley and to some extent here in the, the Boston area, and a number of them have tried to do it. Um, I don't think anyone has really pulled off a um, a created location. Uh, these things tend to emerge organically. Um, the closest, actually, that I, I think we might come to something like that is the Shinchu uh, Science Park in, in Taiwan, where I visited 20, actually 30 years ago as a young assistant professor because they have a university there. National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. And at that point, there was nothing there, but they were beginning to create a, the beginnings of an industrial park around the university. And now, 30, less than 30 years later, it is an astonishing, uh, an astonishingly transformed location with, with both Taiwanese companies and also many Western companies having located initially manufacturing, but subsequently research and development uh, laboratories. And so that's actually one example, I would say, uh, maybe there are others, but one that I know a little bit of a place that has been created. But most efforts to do that haven't really worked out terribly well so far. Where the Russians are starting from is so far back that even uh, partially successful initiative would probably make a significant difference to the Russian economy if, mm -hmm. you know, if it's organized well and if its links to the rest of Russia are well designed. I mean, there's certainly economies that one can point to over the last 20, 30 years, South Korea or Singapore, that have taken off along technological lines, I think. Indeed. And I think those examples, Israel is another one uh, that the Russians are looking at and thinking, well, can we, can we emulate? Uh, but of course, an entirely different scale, and and the scale is really, uh, I mean, the geographical scale in Russia is just extraordinary. Although they're trying to concentrate it, and they're trying to concentrate it, I think for the re they, you know, there is a view they they have the view that if they start in a physically concentrated in a particular location, maybe it can diffuse outwards into the rest of the economy. And Does a research university need to be at the heart of it? They Is that part of the That's equation? part of the plan, and that's one of the things that MIT, if we were to go forward with them, uh, would, be, would be working with them on. And of course the question there is, do you bring existing universities into the location, and of course they have many, some of them quite strong, or do you try to create something from scratch, which might 
also have advantages given the somewhat encrusted nature of the Soviet research system. I should say the Russian <laughs> research system, but it did look a little Soviet from time to time <laughs> in our, during our visit. And if you had to put a, a price tag order of magnitude on something like this? In terms of the total cost to the Russians of doing something like yeah. this? Yes. Oh, I would think tens, hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, I haven't seen any such numbers, but mm -hmm. but this is a huge, huge initiative. With payoffs in 10, 15, 20 years or so? Well, I think if they were if they were looking for payoffs in anything less than, if they're looking for economic payoffs in anything less than 20 years, I think that that would be um, a big strategic error. If they're looking for payoffs in terms of changing ways of thinking and changing attitudes, changing ways of doing things, one might hope to see payoffs sooner, five, and ten these years These are perhaps. all topics you discussed the yes. when you were there? Yes, yes. Yeah. And who does one discuss them with? Well, what mostly what ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we were Russian meeting with quite senior people um, in government and in the business community and, you know, heads of universities and the Academy mm -hmm. of Sciences and so on. Um, but I would say the most interesting and, and stimulating discussions were the ones that took place with just the MIT people. When it comes to helping other countries, and MIT's doing a fair bit of partnering with um, Singapore, Portugal, uh, I mean, a a real mm. range of countries. Mm. How does MIT think about, is this a country w we want to help, or, or doesn't that issue arise? I think that we have not been, we have done a fair amount of this, and I don't think we have been as strategic in our judgments about who we um, work with um, as we probably should have been. That's a personal view. Um, but the reasons for MIT to engage in these kinds of, of collaborations are, are many. Um, obviously, there are financial reasons, and I think that's one of the things that probably more than anything else actually drives the has driven the administration, especially with its l you know legitimate concerns about the sustainability of funding from the from the U.S. government, which of course is such an important part of our um, financial base. So financial issues have driven a lot of these decisions, but, um, you know, there has to be um, an intellectual payoff for our faculty. And more than anything else, that seems to me to be the, the key issue. And sometimes that intellectual payoff can take the form of and probably most of the time can take the form of collaborations with, with counterparts, other researchers. But in many cases, these partnerships that we've established don't necessarily have that kind of capability. Mm -hmm. um, in other cases, it may be just the intrinsic interest of the country. Uh, it's going someplace that looks like it might be important. Um, its history may have been important. Uh, uh, so there's a sort of, a, or, or something that's happening may be uh, an important phenomenon for MIT investigators to explore, but there has to be some kind of intellectual um, driver for mm -hmm. this. And um, I think in the case of Russia, th actually there is, um, uh, in the sense that despite 20 years of the harshest deprivation when it comes to funding of the Soviet, uh, the Russian, I keep saying Soviet, but the Russian science and, and engineering uh, structure, there's still really quite remarkable pockets of, of strength. Um, and so I could see, perhaps more than in any other case, well, the British, I mean, maybe there's another example there, but I could certainly see opportunities for um, real uh, symmetric flows of knowledge and insight between 
investigators in some fields, mm -hmm. investigators in Russia and, and here in the U.S. at MIT specifically. You started out as a nuclear engineer and you're currently chair of the Nuclear Science and Engineering Department, but much of your research and writing is about innovation and productivity. Um, topics traditionally found in business schools, economics departments, public policy programs. How much science and engineering do you still do? Well, it depends how you define engineering. Um, in, uh, in the sort of conventional narrow sense of engineering, I'm probably not doing very much and haven't done for a long time. But if one thinks about engineering as being basically about the application of, of technology and figuring out how to make technology produce things of value, services of value, I would say that I'm still in some ways engaged in engineering because a lot of what I'm doing has to do with the obstacles to applying technology in the world and how to ov overcome those obstacles and how to also educate people, our own students, to think about how to do that and solve those kinds of problems. So in that sense, I'd say I'm still doing <laughs> engineering in, in, in a little bit. What, what drew you to nuclear engineering initially? Well, I grew up in, in, in the UK, and um, like many of us probably uh, in this room, I, I'm a child of the Cold War. And I was, as I was growing up, I was always, not always, but thinking like probably many, many people did at that time about the, 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 the potential for harm that nuclear technology could um, uh, had and how this might be controlled. And uh, that was always a, an issue for me. And even while I was an undergraduate, and even actually before I was an undergraduate, um, that was an issue and an interesting problem for me uh, to think about. And uh, you couldn't, in those days in the UK, actually study nuclear technology as an undergraduate. There wasn't really an opportunity. But, um, at, and there wasn't either, really, a graduate school, which is sort of why I came. To, uh, to MIT to study nuclear engineering. So you knew as an undergraduate that you were interested and you tried to study things that were related, even if it wasn't called a department of nuclear? Whatever. Yes, and actually I managed to find a way while I was an undergraduate. Um, uh, we had little projects that we did in our third year in those days in the UK. Engineering was only a three-year program and I did a little experiment irradiating um, a little little potassium iodide uh, um, tablet. So I, I started a little bit there, but I always knew, even at that time, that that the re I had a reason for for wanting to study nuclear engineering, and it wasn't necessarily to be the best nuclear engineer. It was that that seemed to me because my background was science and math and and uh, engineering, that seemed to me to be the best avenue to going to where I really wanted to go, which was to think about problems of control of this very, um, very important, very powerful, and also very dangerous, potentially very dangerous technology. But you didn't follow a political science or public policy no, and armaments discussions. Really and I, I didn't even really know that such a possibility existed, uh, I don't think, certainly not as an undergraduate. And, um, you know, I, I, it was an incremental move in that direction. I knew engineering or a little bit about engineering, so I thought, well, let's keep going on this path. And that's why, you know, when I came to MIT, I came into the nuclear engineering department. But when I got here, I discovered this extraordinary I mean, really extraordinary range of other related activities um, on the campus, and it was just a, an eye-opener. And, and I got a little bit involved, uh, as much as I could, given the heavy demands of the curriculum in nuclear engineering. I couldn't spend too much time, but I learned about courses in political science, courses at Harvard. While you were still, while I was still a, graduate, a graduate student. student. Yeah, yeah.
What kinds of other courses, related courses or unrelated courses, there did were you take? There were in political science, there was a wonderful arms control course that used to be taught by George Rathjens and, and Jack Ruina, which I remember taking. At MIT. And at MIT and at Harvard. Um, there were wonderful science policy courses that were taught by Harvey Brooks, who actually became my thesis reader, um, a marvelous, marvelous man who really taught me a great deal about how to think about science and technology policy. It sounds like as a child, to the extent you were thinking of control issues, they were more about preventing bombs um, rather than nuclear waste which may be where you sort of headed next? Yes, and I, 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 that's true. Um, but when I got to MIT, um, I quickly uh, learned that uh, the professor in the Department of Nuclear Engineering, who was sort of closest to the sorts of issues I was interested in, was a man called David Rose. And David Rose at the time was um, interested in nuclear waste, and he had other students working on this problem, and he involved me in a in a project, um, which was um, a actually a, a, a this is we now remember talking about 1974, 75, and not too many people were really thinking about nuclear waste in those days. But he got me involved in a problem, a nuclear waste problem at West Valley in upstate New York. And uh, that became my first publication. Uh, I wrote a, an article, uh, I think it was my first publication, I wrote an article for Technology Review and it was the cover story on Technology Review and it had bright red letters and uh, against a white background. I can't remember exactly what it said, but it was something about nuclear waste. and. And that sort of started me off down that road. Um, and then I continued to do work uh, in the nuclear waste area, although that wasn't actually this topic of my doctoral dissertation. Uh, I stayed involved in nuclear waste for quite some time. When and how did you begin your shift gradually into the more and more policy um, sometimes even less connected with uh, nuclear, nuclear issues. Well, I, I was involved in policy issues even as a, a, you know, even as a graduate student, and my doctoral dissertation was, had an important, had a big policy component. It concerned the, a new technology at the time for enriching uranium, which has the potential, of course, anytime you can enrich uranium, you can potentially make nuclear weapons material, which is highly enriched in the U-235 isotope. And a new technology was coming along at that time, which used lasers to enrich uranium. And my thesis was to explore the feasibility of laser enrichment of uranium, and then to explore the the potential implications of having a new technology that might be readily available to countries and even subnational groups. Uh, what did that mean? And so there was a policy component even there. And when I joined the department as a faculty member in 1979, after I completed my thesis, my arrangement with the then department head, Norm Rasmussen, was that I would need to spend half of my time teaching and research time doing more or less conventional nuclear engineering work. But the other half I could work on the things that really were driving me, and they were, they were policy related. The, the initially, nuclear waste and other nuclear fuel cycle issues. But over time, I became interested in the question of why was it, and remember this was in the sort of early 1980s, after a few, few years after Three Mile Island, um, why was it that more or less the same nuclear power plants were being built in different places, both in the US but in other parts of the world, at vastly different costs? And uh, why was it that these same power plants that, you know, to a layperson, you couldn't really tell the difference. They all look more or less the same, and indeed they were more or less the same. Why were they operating with such vastly different efficiencies? This seemed to me to be an important question to explore, and that got me a little bit into 
um, organizational questions, management questions, I reached out to colleagues in, ma in the management school and in the economics department for help on these questions and they taught me quite a bit and so th the, the agenda was sort of evolving a little bit in the direction that eventually I, I followed. When the nuclear science and engineering department hired you and let you do half-time policy, were they hiring you despite that or because of that? Or, or that's, I, it's, uh, that's, I think probably, the, uh, I think probably both. There were no doubt some people in the department that were willing to take me on despite the fact that they were gonna have to put up with this policy stuff. But there were other people in the department, including the department head, who I think thought that, who thought that this was um, an important thing for a nuclear engineering department to do. And it should be said that uh, the department had been doing this, uh, particularly under the leadership of David Rose, who'd been involved in these policy issues for several years before that. So, and in fact, I would say that the nuclear department of all the engineering departments at MIT was probably by necessity engaged in thinking about policy issues um, so before almost, I think before any other engineering department. So there was, an, there was an orientation there and I think when they hired me they, you know, they kind of knew that I could do nuclear engineering uh, so that it wasn't in that sense a huge risk. Your thesis topic, is that a th the, the laser um, use for uh, enriching radioisotopes? Yeah. It, is that a theoretical topic, or does one do that experimentally? I mean, well, I didn't. Um, it was a, m my contribution was to analyze the different processes that, that could be that could use lasers and it, but you, know, you weren't analyzing but I wasn't them by trying doing them in this lab. version and no. that version in a lab no, somewhere. No, there were, I mean these are big uh, at the time and even today these are fairly large scale complicated systems and I was not at any point in my career really an experimentalist anyway so no, these were assessments of the of the of the process and thinking about you know what the energy requirements would be what other requirements would be to make it work so you were an assistant professor and um, I guess were promoted to associate professor without tenure which is the normal step and yeah. then in 1986 you were chosen as executive director of the MIT Commission on Industrial Productivity um, who put that commission together and why were you chosen for that? Well, the, the commission was put together, actually it was uh, Paul Gray and John Deutsch, the then president and provost, who I think certainly they made the decision to put it together and, and may also have been responsible for the even for the idea, although I think after the fact there were many others who claimed <laughs> that they had been responsible for, for um, proposing this. Um, and the U.S. economy was kind of in the doldrums and or the industrial sector? The industrial sector was under uh, real pressure at that time. Um, people, many people won't remember this, but the real source of the problem is it was understood to be uh, was uh, was Japan, uh, which was at that time uh, competing very effectively in electronics, automobiles, and a variety of other industries. And there were questions really at that time, which had begun in the late 70s, I suppose, and really uh, accelerated during the 1980s about the survivability of uh, the American manufacturing sector. And Paul and John uh, felt that this was a subject that MIT might be able to uh, shed some light on. What were the reasons for the for the problems, um, and what could be done about them? And um, this was a very MIT-like thing to do. And uh, 
you know, it was something that really, I think, at that time, and maybe even still today, differentiates MIT from most other universities. The idea that we would, you know, take a big, challenging, national scale problem and bring a group of faculty together uh, to study it and come up with some recommendations. I mean, this was. I remember after the study was done, the study became known as the Made in America study because that was the title of the book that we published. Um, the, pres the then president of Caltech, I remember talking to him, and 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 you know he, there's always a little bit of rivalry, as you know, and uh, and uh, he said, uh, you know, I think that. Caltech is every bit as good as MIT and better in some ways, but I have to say there's one thing that I don't think we could ever have contemplated doing, and that was the Made in America project. And it was uh, really, uh, you know, I don't think unique in MIT's history because I think if you go back far enough that you'll find other efforts that had somewhat of this this character. But this was a this was a pretty unusual thing to do, and John and, and Paul really, I think, deserve a lot of credit for pulling it together. And do you have any clue about how or why you got pulled in as executive director? You know, I, maybe they were looking for a, a victim or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I, I knew John I, and Paul to a lesser degree, and actually had 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 I think I'd written a paper with John at some point earlier in the in the decade, and uh, they probably saw me as someone who, uh, first of all, probably you know had a lot of energy and and um, you know uh, also had a history even at that point of working with colleagues in the social sciences and and management sciences, and this was fundamentally uh, a meeting, one might even say a collision, of the engineers and the, and the social scientists at MIT uh, around this topic of, in of industrial productivity. And so it needed somebody who had a, you know, some degree of ambidextrous <laughs> you know, Characteristics, and I, that, so that may have had an, uh, that may have been something to do with, with with it. Do you know if you had tenure at that point, and and were you concerned that it might divert you from research and publishing and interfere with your career and your promotion prospects and in the field you had chosen? I don't actually think that I did have tenure at that point. I was probably coming close to it, um, and. I suppose it might have been considered a, a risky career move, um, but um, I knew some of the people who were going to be involved in this thing, and I knew how much I was going to learn from them. I mean, I knew, for example, that Bob Solo was going to be involved, and and um, Les Thoreau and and uh, Paul Krugman were also from the economic side involved in this thing, and several of the department heads in the engineering. So I knew that this was going to be um, very, very interesting. I knew that it was, a, of course, I knew it was a problem of you know, major, major significance to the country. And it just seemed like a pretty exciting thing to do. And one piece of advice that I got, and it was one of the best pieces of advice I ever had from anybody at MIT, and it was from Jerry Wilson when I, when I was first hired as a young assistant professor. And Jerry said, you know, and I think he probably said this to every assistant professor, he said, you know, y y you have to do what you really want to do. Because, you know, it's pretty hard to get ahead here. And unless you really are enjoying something, you're probably not going to succeed. So choose the things that really fire you up. And that you know that was great advice, and it was in this case advice that I that I followed. Would he have been dean of engineering? He was dean of engineering. As a matter of fact, and Jerry was on. Subsequently, wow. he served. As, he was one of the members of this commission on industrial productivity. But he was at the time the dean of engineering. <coughs> Tell us about 
how the commission proceeded? Well, the commission consisted of about 14, 14 or 15 professors, administrators. Paul was on it, John was on it, um, Jerry Wilson, Dean of Engineering, um, Les Thoreau, I think, might have been Dean of Sloan at that point. And uh, leading professors from many disciplines, uh, some of which you might have expected, others perhaps less less likely. But we had, you know, the head of Aero Astro, Gene Covert, and Mert Flemings, who was head of materials. Uh, on the social science side, I mentioned uh, uh, Paul and and uh, Paul Krugman and Bob Solo and. The chairman was. The chairman was Mike Tuzos, who at the time uh, was ha was director of the lab for computer science, an electrical engineer. Um, on the uh, again on the social science side, uh, Suzanne Berger was a member of this. Tom Koken, now the chairman of the faculty. Um, Did you have hearings or we studies? Or? We met. Uh, I think it was ev every two weeks. And fairly quickly, we decided that we were going to approach the problem by choosing what became eight industries, eight manufacturing industries, where some of them old, some of them new. So textiles and apparel at the old end, electronics and computers and telecoms. and uh, So it was a, a broad range, aero, the aerospace industry, um, steel, you know, at the other end of the spectrum. And we organized ourselves around, um, initially at least, around uh, s subgroups that um, went out into the field and talked to practitioners, uh, both managers, but also people in the workplace. Um, and we came back with an, in, uh, and this took place over a period of several months, and there were graduate students involved and postdocs, and my job was to kind of organize this effort. And it was a huge effort. Eventually, it involved something like 80 or 90 people, uh, many of them faculty, but others were postdocs. And because we recruited, you know, once we decided we were going to study the, let's say, the steel industry, we recruited people on the faculty who knew a lot about that industry to participate with us. And it became a pretty big activity. And a group that went out to investigate and would include everybody from the grad students uh, up through some committee yes, members? But, but yes, absolutely. But not, the but not, the, by f not because we probably visited, I don't remember exactly, but I think we probably, there were two or three hundred companies that we visited during the course of the study, not only in the U.S., but in Japan and Europe. Did you go and on any of those? Oh, I did. I did. Um, and it was, it was, you know, these were invariably fascinating trips. And one of the things that made them fascinating was that very often we had in the group, which might have even only consisted of two people, but almost always there was a, a, tec a technically knowledgeable person and a social scientist. And that interaction was uh, really very stimulating and became, by the way, the one of the sort of design features, the design principles for the Industrial Performance Center. But before we got to doing these visits and studying these industries, uh, we had a period of intense, and I use that word d uh, deliberately, intense discussion among this group of 14 faculty about what really is the nature of this problem. And I would say that uh, the commission nearly broke up before it got started, uh, before it really got started over that, during that period, because you had very strong voices uh, on, and it essentially broke down uh, along economic versus engineer, uh, economists versus engineers. I mean, that's a somewhat of an oversimplification. But, you know, there were strong voices. I remember Paul Krugman was very vocal on this point. And he was, I think, to some extent, being a bit of a pro provocateur, as he loved to be in those days and still does today. Um, you know, saying, look, this isn't really a problem that, that we need to spend a lot of time thinking about. This is, 
This is a problem of exchange rates. If we just fix the exchange rate, we can. So he was sort of stirring up the engineers who rose to the bait and said, look, this is not anything to do with the exchange rate. This is to do with our failure, our failure to take the technology that we so brilliantly develop in the MIT labs and do something useful with it. And you know, all this technology that we're developing in MIT is being productively used by the Japanese. And the problem is that our American firm. So that's basically where this commission started. Where it ended up was a very different place from either of those two starting positions. But we nearly broke up over that. I mean, people just had no patience for the other for the other side, and all credit goes to Mike Dutuzos, um who basically hammered people into shape uh, <laughs> and kept them uh, kept them at it. Uh, and over time, you know, in good MIT tradition, people didn't agree with each other, but they said, "Look, let's stop arguing about this. Let's go and collect some information. Let's collect the data." And the data that we collected was actually collected in a way that was not, you know, particularly familiar to many of, certainly many of the technical people, which was, let's go out and talk to people and ask them questions and figure out what they think. And in that process, we were guided, I think, very importantly by Suzanne Berger, who um, was, um, of course, uh, already at that point, a very leading, a leading figure in in her discipline of political science, political economy, but who had done a great deal of interviewing uh, as part of her um, own research and helped, you know, organize. And she was enormously helpful. And I know in in my work, she really was a tremendous source of advice in and and helping to get this big activity organized. I would have thought that it, somebody in industrial organization would have come closest to sort of well, thinking well, through problems like this, but you, you didn't. We didn't We didn't have an I.O. person. We did have a, an industrial relations person, Tom Koken, labor relations, a member of the commission, and he was also an important voice. Mm-hmm. How was this all funded, and what kind of price tag was there? It was funded, and this was, I think, a very sound decision. Uh, we only used foundation funding. There was no government funding and no industry funding. And we were fortunate to receive funding from the Sloan Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation. The price tag, I'm not going to remember exactly, but I think it was on the order of a million dollars, uh, maybe a little a little more than that. And, um, uh, I, you know, I think the fact that we didn't rely on government or industry funding, it, it probably wouldn't have affected the outcome in terms of the intellectual outcome. But I, I think that we, it gave us um, a kind of a, it, 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 it created a, a, an environment for the study, which I think was very important. You know, at the time, there were there were many I and mean, we heard them we we actually solicited the views in industry that said um you know this the problem here is lazy american workers and uh you know we heard that a lot from from american you know leaders of american industry and then there were you know views on the labor side that we heard a lot and and i think and the government had I mean, there were government policies that were, of course, the, the administration at the time was completely committed to. We didn't have to worry about these views. We had to worry about them intellectually, but we certainly didn't have to worry about them in terms of, you know, how what people were going to think about what we said. And that was, I think, a very wise, wise it's decision. It's interesting how different the structure sounds like it was from another study that was going on almost simultaneously, I think, the, the one on the auto industry, um, which was funded by industry and maybe by governments, and even though they held individual contributions to no more than 5%, so that nobody could put pressure on them, 
um, it it was a very different approach. It was a different Although approach. Although in the end, that too was a study of an industry and productivity and. Uh, and it, and in fact, there were there were uh, connections between uh, between the two studies. On my staff were postdocs and graduate students who were also contributing to the automobile right. study, and we derived uh, some of our, uh, we, we used some of the research from the automobile study, which was one of the eight industries that we were concerned with. But I think that we avoided some of the difficulties that that study had to deal with. Along with Bob Solo and, and the late Michael Dertuzos, you were named co-author of the book that grew out of the commission's work, the, the Made in America regaining the productive edge. How much impact do you think the book had? Did it change American industry or yeah, economy in any way? It's or? very difficult to answer a question. I mean, how much, it, uh, how much impact does any book have? Um, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer. I do think that it had a much bigger impact than any of us when we were writing it expected. Um, it became um, and I think may even still be today the best-selling book in the history of MIT Press. Uh, but it had other impacts, and I, I think th that um, you know there was an, there was a lot of interest at that time in what this group had found, and one of the contributions that I think it made was to change the the direction of the of the debate. Uh, it, it changed a little bit the way people thought about this problem. Um, from from what to what? I, I think, you know, a big, a, an important view, a sort of a predominant view when, when we got into this was, uh, you know, this was the Japanese unfair competition, you know, uh, currency manipulation. We're not, not unfamiliar today, but now we talk about China. Um, that, you know, they were unfair in how they competed, they were taking our intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera. That was the, I'd say, the, almost the prevailing view when we got started. When we were finished, and what we said was, this is really, um, this is an issue that we are, we here in the U.S. have responsibility for. The, the problems, we have a lot of problems that have to do with, one of the things we said was underinvestment in research, but that was sort of what any university group of university professors would, would be expected to say. But I think m more than that, and more importantly, we talked about problems in the way work was being organized on the factory floor, and problems uh, of, um, uh, walls being erected, organizational walls being erected between, you know, research and development, production, marketing, and so on. We saw very rigid structures in American firms which we weren't seeing in their competitors. And I think in the end, we also were seeing problems uh, importantly at that time, and even, of course, even more importantly today, with uh, the educational capabilities, the educational qualifications, the knowledge in the workforce. So what we did, I think, was to change the, a little bit the direction of the public policy debate. And also, and this turned out to be maybe even more uh, significant, I think there was a real impact on management in, in American uh, corporations. I think that they thought about their problems in a somewhat different way. Uh, and, you know, the, I remember Les Thoreau at the beginning of the study saying, everybody was given the opportunity when we first sat down in, in one of the conference rooms to sort of tell us what they thought the problem was. And Les Thoreau said, you know, the, the, I remember he said, that this is death by a thousand cuts. But by the end of the study, we didn't think that. We th thought that there were six or seven key problems that we had to address as a society. 
And I think that was a contribution that we we took a very very c what seemed to be and was a very very complicated mm -hmm. problem, and boiled it down to a few key issues. And I think that helped people. After the commission finished its work and the book was published, the industrial performance center was created here at MIT, and you became head of it. What was involved in the decision to set it up, and what did it take to get off the ground, and uh, did you have any reservations about continuing to follow this path and to stay with it? Well, on, on the last point, no. I mean, I, I had spent two years of my life really, you know, immersing myself in this problem and realized at the end of it that I just, you know, there was a lot more to learn, and it was fascinating, and um, there was this wonderful group of faculty that had really been living with each other, more or less, for a, a, a period of, of a year or two, and many of them wanted to continue uh, with this work, not full time, but uh, in most cases, but uh, you know, as part of their intellectual uh, agenda, and so. For me, you know, the opportunity was, I mean, it just seemed like the right thing to do, um, to, to continue. And, uh, you know, the, how we would do, how we would organize was also fairly clear in the sense that, you know, the, the style of work we had, we had begun in, in the commission, which was, you know, very interdisciplinary, involving people from different departments committed in every case to field research, direct observation of particular industries and practices in particular industries. That was, you know, we'd started that in the commission and that seemed to be a good, a good uh, template for a continuing research agenda. The questions, there were many questions that Made in America raised but didn't answer, so we even had a, you know, an intellectual agenda. So it was, it was a natural thing to do, and for me it was a natural thing to do because Jerry Wilson's advice, <laughs> do what you're interested in. Uh, setting it up was not trivial because the commission had had, I mean it was always seen as a one-time event, you know, when it was done, it was done, and uh, but this was now to be a, an ongoing research activity. And the provost at the time, um, a wise man, uh, Mark Wrighton, who's now, as you know, uh, president of Wash U, um, uh, made a very important decision and said, look, we're, we're going to, let's do this. I'm going to put it in my office for the time being until it, until it um, develops momentum and then at some point I'm probably not going to want it anymore. But for the time being, uh, it can report to me. And uh, we were able to get funding, a large amount of funding actually, uh, uh, from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to get us going. Um, and so the organizational uh, home in the Provost Office and the funding that came from the Sloan Foundation were what was needed to, um, uh, to, get, to get the thing going. Did you think about changing departments at that point, or having the Dean of Engineering uh, as an advocate was sufficient to keep you in nuclear? Well, you know, the, dep the department, I have to say, and um, the, uh, my department, uh, nuclear, now science and engineering, just engineering as it then was, uh, had sort of tolerated my uh, wayward uh, <laughs> Uh, activities for quite some time um, and very generously you know they I talked to you know obviously talked to the department head and said I'd really like to do this what do you think and and um, and he said fine you know we'd like you to keep teaching in the in the department and I said of course um, and um, have continued to play a, a role even over this period of where I was mainly involved with the IPC, um, they were generous in mm -hmm. saying, if that's what you want to do, do it. And so I felt that 
I didn't really feel that I needed a different uh, a departmental base because my department was uh, comfortable with it, even though, you know, the benefits were really only very peripheral to mm -hmm. them, uh, to those colleagues. But the the issue of department was, in some sense, a secondary issue um, because we, you know, this was a very, very interdisciplinary group from, from the outset. Um, I mean, there's some of the key players, Suzanne Berger continued to be involved, uh, Tom Koken also. New people joined the group. Uh, Mike Puri from uh, economics uh, became very involved in the center. He hadn't been a member of the commission, although his research with Chuck Sable had been a very important influence on the commission. Um, from the uh, electrical engineering department, uh, actually Raphael became involved uh, at some point, Charlie Sodini. So there were new people, but there was this network of, of, of alumni of the commission who had been, uh, uh, who had worked together, really knew each other very well and provided in some sense the, the core faculty for the IPC. Innovation is a major focus of your center. Why? I think we have to go back to when, when the center was formed and really the agenda that we inherited from the Productivity Commission, which was a lot about manufacturing and production and uh, efficiency and productivity of, of the production process. But it was becoming already pretty clear at that point, and we're talking about the early 1990s, that the competitiveness of American industry was going to depend on more than its performance in its factories, uh, and increasingly was going to be determined by its effectiveness in the development and introduction of new products and services, in other words, innovation. And one of the things that struck me at the time was that a lot of the business chatter about innovation was really uh, rather it was it was already cliched before I mean it was it, 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 it was almost born as a cliche you know you had to listen to the voice of the customer you had to um, cooperate and break down walls and and integration was important across um, across functions and there were all of these prescriptions that people, you know, banded around, but but it seemed that many of these things were actually very hard to do. And to figure out why they were so hard to do really looked like an important um, research project, which became actually more than just a project. It became a, um, a sort of a program. And at that point, um, um, Mike Puri uh, was starting to get involved in the work of the center, and he and I began a collaboration. This is probably, I don't know, around 92, 93, um, which was focused on this problem. Actually, initially it was focused on the problem of integration in business organizations and why that was such a hard thing for them to do, integration across functions, across boundaries, and so on. But uh, we started a program of research, or we, we and you know, in this style that we had inherited from the commission, we identified some firms that were doing interesting things that seemed to have integration issues. So um, medical devices, where the integration problem was clinicians versus science, and how to overcome that barrier, a series of other, and um, it became clear that as we talk to these people about uh, the problems of integration, that integration was very much um, a part of the innovation task. That is, as we talk to people about, you know, why integration was so hard, we increasingly were drawn into discussions of how they were developing and introducing new products. And um, that what we learned from those uh, interactions uh, became the sort of the basis for um, a long-term investigation into how businesses actually innovate. Um, and 
th that led to a, a book, it led to a whole series <laughs> of other projects, um, and it really has infused, that, that work that began in the mid-1990s has infused a lot of what the Center has done ever since. Do you think innovation is something that can be taught or cultivated or learned? I, I guess that's at the heart of, of what you're talking about with Russia, for example, maybe, and other? Well, I think, I think that there are um, certainly techniques and practices um, that can be taught and learned. Um, but one of the parts of the process that we were most interested in and remain most interested in is the part that doesn't really lend itself to techniques and practices. And in particular, it's the part that has to do with the, 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 the creative part. And what we discovered in our research um, was, and it's not surprising, that that's the part that people don't really have the ability to talk about very well. They can't even really articulate what what's going on at that stage of the process. And so you you know you have things like um, you know people talk about uh, brainstorming and and um, you know one of my favorite cliches is you know you you have to you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you come up with the, you find the prince. Um, by the way, when I've used that um, uh, cliche in, in France from time to time, I give talks over there, it doesn't always go down so well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but what was striking was that people didn't really have a way of talking about it. I mean, they just had these sort of thing, uh, words that they used to describe it. And, and we, s in our research, have really tried to understand what goes on during the creative part of the innovation process. And we came to think that um, there was a whole vocabulary that was missing for to describe this. It, it, you know, people just used these terms which, which tended to focus on the individual and, you know, the creative individual coming up with, the, with an idea. But actually, uh, in our studies of companies in industries as diverse as cellular telephones and blue jeans, the fashion jeans and automobiles and all sorts of other things. I mean, we, we came to see, first of all, that it's typically not a individual, but it's more a social process that is involved in the development of new ideas for products. And over time, we developed our own vocabulary for um, describing this phase of the, you know, some people call, refer to it as a sort of fuzzy front end of the innovation process. We came to think of this as an interpretive part of the process, as distinct from the analytical part, which is the part that most engineers are much more comfortable talking about. It's problem solving. In fact, many of the people we talked to said, yeah, design is problem solving. It's a, it's a form of problem solving. But our question was always, well, how do you know what problem you're supposed to be solving? Where does the problem come from? And when that question was posed to the practitioners, particularly the engineers, they had great difficulty. They knew that that was an important question, but they didn't have a way of talking about how it happened. And the focus of our research, Mike, Mike Peoria and myself spent, you know, a number of years really um, uh, following companies and talking to practitioners and so on. It was to try to develop a, a, a vocabulary and a way of talking about the, you know, what happens when you don't know what the problem is that you're supposed to be solving. And when you think about our curriculum in the engineering school at MIT, we're great at uh, problem solving. I mean, we probably, I mean, that's what engineering really is about. But we don't spend a lot of time teaching and helping our students think about the, uh, the processes through which problems emerge. And as I say, we, we came to think of this as being a, 
really essentially an interpretive process, very, very different from the analytical problem-solving approach. Partly a question of how you choose what to work on? How you choose what to work on. Where do, where do the problems come from? Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we came to think of this as being something that happens often literally, but sometimes metaphorically, uh, um, in in the form of a conversation. You know, when you start a conversation, you don't typically know where it's going to head. This conversation may be a little different. You know exactly where it's going. But um, uh, in many cases, conversations, when they start, you really don't know where the conversation is going. But often something interesting happens, and uh, you start to sort of develop it. And, and we came actually to draw on ideas from linguistics um, and the development even of languages mm -hmm. uh, as a helpful way of thinking about what goes on in the in these stages of the innovation process. But as you look at MIT, certainly people here are very good at the analysis, but one of the things that seems to make it unusual perhaps is that they're really good at having ideas other people don't have and going off in directions they haven't. I mean, I think perhaps that's why there are so many Nobels and, and, and the like, that, that whatever it is, it has been part of the culture perhaps? And one of the things that I think we don't fully appreciate about what we have here um, is that it's a kind, uh, MIT is a kind of a public space within which these kinds of conversations, creative conversations in which new ideas emerge, take place all the time. Mm -hmm. And when, when people think about MIT, and in particular its interactions with industry, they tend to think about professors and students solving problems for companies. And of course that does happen. Uh, sometimes companies come and say, you know, we've got this very particular problem, we'd like to help you We'd like you to help us solve it. But a lot of times what goes on in our interactions with industry and with firms isn't that at all. It's that they, they come here, they want to be here because they want to be part of a conversation about the direction in which a discipline is moving or the direction in which markets, a particular market may be moving. And those conversations are the raw materials in some sense from which the problems emerge that eventually get solved, often not by our faculty and students, but by the companies working in their own labs. So you have this dual role that the Institute plays, problem solving for firms, but also serving as a public space within which people come in and out. And that's the other thing about MIT. It's very, very porous, you know, and it's porous both within the institution, disciplines, you know, there's constant interactions so between departments, universities. much more so than, than most. Maybe less so today because other universities, you know, are I think beginning to do this better, but MIT has always had that character. I think partly, this is going to sound a little chauvinistic, because engineers tend to not care quite as much about departmental and disciplinary boundaries as, as some other uh, branches of academia and the you know the Institute has always been very much engineering oriented so I think that we you know we serve as a public space within which these conversations both literal and metaphorical can take place and I think that's one of the reasons why we have been such a prolific institution in terms of, of new new ideas and and the ability for those ideas to find a home somewhere and to be developed and, and exploited. Have you looked at what kinds of labs work as you talk about innovation and ideas that a number of labs run through my mind? Um, something like the Skunk Works, I think, at Xerox. Um, ideas like at the Sloan School, the, the uh, 150 Hundred thousand. They give awards yep. for entrepreneurship and ideas. Yep. Yep. Um, the Amy Smith Design Lab here. They're very different, and yet all of them seem to have 
creativity as, as their focus in a, a funny way. They are very different. Um, and But I think, you know, um, one of the things that from a distance they perhaps have in, in common, uh, the skunk works at Xerox is a different, I mean, that that's a, a very mixed story, as you, as you know. But some of these other things that you mentioned, I think what they may have in common is there's something about the interaction between the designer, the developer, and the user. Woody Flowers and the 207, 270 contest is another one. That's another, that's another example. And I think, I, you know, th there's something very difficult for engineers to grapple with here, and I've found that in, as I talk about this issue with, with my colleagues, because engineers like closed form problems. They like to know what the problem is, what resources do we have to solve it, how long do we have to solve it, who are the experts in the different areas, let's us divide the problem up into the pieces and ask each expert to, to, to um, deal with his or her piece and then somehow the thing gets pulled together and the quicker you pull it together the better and that you know we we know about that but there's also and this is going back to this other there's also this open-ended thing that happens before you even get to the problem that needs to be solved and I think that some of the things that you talk about at, at MIT that you mention you can look at them in different ways. You can look at them as being about problem solving, but you can also look at the same activity as being part of some continuing open-ended conversation between designers, developers, and users, in which the artifact that comes out, the design, the product, even the company, is a thing that people then talk about in some continuing conversation. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at this thing not just as a if you look at this extraordinary set of activities that we have at MIT, if you, you can look at them as producing things, you know, businesses, products, but you can also think about them as part of some ongoing engagement between MIT and the world. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I think, you know, in some sense, the key to understanding the prolific nature of MIT is to think in terms of that ongoing in engagement between MIT and the world and the fact that we've, we've actually come up with a whole variety of different ways of yeah. having those yeah. engagements. Bob Langer and the Langer Lab is another. But it, it's something about anointing creativity and saying this is really important and good and giving people then the goal, perhaps, of, of becoming good at it, or, or the freedom to feel they can do it, or, or something, and to take risks. To uh, all of that, but also the signal, the message that engagement with the world is good. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, um, engagement with, with the world of practice, it's in order to figure out what the problems are, that need to be solved, that that's good. And we give that signal, and we create opportunities f for that in many, in, many di in many different ways. Coming back to your own center, would you say there's a new discipline emerging, or is the work you do mostly based on an amalgam of tools from other disciplines and, and a willingness to, to use tools from different disciplines? It's, I think, more the latter. Uh, that is, I've never seen the role of our center as being the creation of a new discipline. In fact, the contrary. Um, wh what I, the, the, the metaphor I, I've always, I, I don't know that I've said this uh, publicly, but the metaphor I've always thought of when I've thought about the work of the center is it's really a kind of a crossroads between different disciplines within MIT and between mostly firms, because those are the, I mean, that's what we work with and on um, at firms and academia. So it's a sort of a crossroads in which people bring their perspectives and, discipli and disciplines and methods to bear. But we don't 
try to capture any of our colleagues in the orbit of the of, of the center. What we hope happens is that people come work with colleagues in different departments, from different departments, on a problem, on a project, and then go back. Uh, probably a little different from what they were like before they got involved, but and maybe their work will move in a somewhat different direction than it would have done if they hadn't been involved with us. But that's not about creating a new discipline, that's about enriching um, existing disciplines with perspectives drawn from somewhere else. And I think that's a very important role for centers to play. There is, a, in academia, always a strong pressure to develop a new discipline, develop a new way of thinking about something. And uh, we all understand why, th you know, where those pressures come from, but, but I think in this particular case, this particular center, um, that hasn't been the objective. It's simply been to give people a chance to learn from each other and maybe be changed a little bit as a result. Much of your focus has been on firms, business entities, but you've also looked explicitly, I think, at higher education and universities. How did that happen and why and, and where are you on that? Well, that, that actually is again, uh, you know, it's this, this idea of uh, the, the center serving as a crossroads. Um, w one of the things that we have done over the years is to organize seminars for faculty um, to think about, you know, particular problems. And one of the seminars that we um, organized probably back in the mid-90s, I don't remember the exact date, was a seminar on the future of the research university, which was a subject of, you know, at then and now, and, you know, real interest, especially to faculty around here. So we convened a group of faculty um, and organized some visits from people who we knew had been thinking hard about this. So it wasn't just a two-hour, one-time thing? It was a year-long uh, series of seminars. And uh, I had a couple of students who were actually writing theses during the year on this subject. And, um, and th it was a very interesting uh, year, and a number of ideas uh, came out of it. And um, r related to that was the something that was happening increasingly around that time our center is located in the same building as the industrial performance, uh, the industrial liaison program, and other kinds of uh, entities that we have at MIT that work with industry. And because we were on in the same building, I noticed a, a growing flow of people coming from uh, really around the world to the ILP, or I know I knew they were going across the road to the technology licensing office, trying to figure out what it is that MIT did and how they could emulate it. And I spoke to many of these groups. They, you know, the ILP and TLO often asked me to meet with them. And one of the things that struck me was, you know, this might not be the right thing for them to try to do, to emulate MIT. They were often coming from a very different place and a very different set of capabilities. And it wasn't obvious to me that emulating MIT was the right thing for um, every university. They were coming from all over the world. But I also realized that we didn't have a, a, we didn't have a framework that that you, you know that might suggest that there are other ways in which universities could contribute to economic development and growth and of course every university or not every but many universities are under pressure to do more and more of that but doing it in the way that MIT does it isn't necessarily within it's not necessarily the right thing. So we initiated a, a, a research program growing out of that seminar and uh, stimulated by these visits from people around the world to study the different ways in which universities can contribute and are contributing to uh, 
economic development and innovation in their regions. And we worked in 25 or so different city regions around the world, focusing in particular on this question of well, what, are, what, are, what are universities in these regions doing? And we deliberately selected places that had first-tier universities or second-tier universities or third-tier universities, different industries driving the economy. And we really learned a great deal about the different ways in which universities contribute. And they don't all look like MIT by any means. And this was how recently or how long ago? We started this uh, work uh, probably around 2000, 2001. And it continued, f has continued for several years, and in some, in a sense, continues even today. Did you try to bring out any of your findings a few years ago, before the financial markets crashed? Research universities were on the hot seat in Washington, and and here. Um, partly because of the size of their endowments, particularly Harvard, Princeton, Yale. Yeah. And policymakers in Washington, Massachusetts, were beginning to suggest that they weren't delivering enough public benefits in, in exchange for the tax benefits that they enjoyed as nonprofits. The question of do they contribute in other ways, I, I think is an interesting one. It, a lot of the conversation among the policymakers came down to why isn't tuition zero? You have so much money. But the question of what do they contribute in the way of innovation or research or yeah. economic uh, bases didn't seem to come up as much. It didn't, but I think there were two separate conversations going on. There was certainly that conversation about the rich universities and why are they benefiting from the tax laws. Yeah. But, but for a much longer period prior to that, there had been a separate conversation that wasn't directed at necessarily places like MIT and Princeton, but at, at, at the local university, the state university, why aren't you doing more um, to contribute to economic development? It's not really that they had, in many cases, they didn't have any endowment or nothing significant. But you know, uh, you, you, we 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 note that you are part of a family of institutions that include Stanford and MIT. Why aren't you? You know, we need more from you, and of course. Um, universities, university administrators were often, you know, willing to to say, "Well, we will do more," because they saw this maybe as a way of of, um, of shoring up their faltering budgets. Um, so there was that conversation going on, um, which I think is actually a longer running and probably more important conversation, than perhaps, than the one that was directed at those few rich universities who were being uh, getting ready to be hauled over the coals. I don't know that it ever actually happened, because, right. as you say, the financial the crash. Uh, is yeah. MIT doing anything on, on this front that you think is interesting or useful? W in terms of contributing? To, I mean, MIT does so much. In terms of? Your model of can they do more? Well, I think what we what what we learned from our studies of this question w was that that what everyone thinks MIT is doing, which is discoveries, patenting, licensing, often to start up companies run by faculty or students, and spin-offs that that is an important thing that we do, but it is only one of the things that we do. Uh, and among the most important things, probably in, s in, the, in, in the larger sense, more important, is education. Um, the technology transfer that happens when people graduate from here and go to work 
uh, at a company. That may not involve starting a new company, but it's mm -hmm. a very important contribution. Another contribution that we make is, you know, the thing that we were talking about before, serving as a public space for industry and and government people to talk with academics about important technical questions. And what what but what has happened in this debate around the country and increasingly around the world is that policymakers have focused on the thing that is in some sense easiest to identify about MIT and Stanford and easiest to count, which is, you know, how many patents, how many licenses, how many startups. And I think a lot of the other things that MIT does and that other universities are probably no less able to do. Maybe they can't do the startups as well as we can, but they can certainly do some of these other things. And unfortunately, the debate has focused too much on, in my judgment, on the, the things that are the most obvious things. And what we have to do is to move this beyond the, the spin-off phenomenon, important as it is. I mean, one of the things I like to point out is that we have a half a million new businesses formed a year, every year in the U.S. And the number of businesses that are formed out of university intellectual property for all American universities each year is just a few hundred. So now it's true that many of those businesses, or some of them at least, succeed and get big and they end up like Cisco or Google or something, but but it's a small part of the what the economy is doing. And similarly on patenting, you know, we every year something like 150,000 patents are, are approved by the PTO. Universities collectively in the US account for less than 3,000 of those 150,000. So it's a so if we were to judge the university impact on the economy just by patents and startups, you'd have to conclude that it's a very small piece, but actually it's a much larger piece. But in order to see that, you have to look more broadly at the range of interactions between the universities and, and industry. When you were growing up in the UK, did you have any links to academe? Were your parents in education or did you ever dream about entering and becoming a professor? M my father was a school teacher. He taught um, uh, what we would call here uh, grade school. Um, and he, So in that sense education was very much part of our, our family and my older sister became a, a teacher. Um, but university wasn't something that was part of our family um, sort of history. And um, so it was, you know, I think this is true of many, many families of my, mm -hmm. in, during my generation that, you know, I was not the first to go to university. I had one other sister who got there a couple of years before me, but, but we weren't um, connected to higher education. And where did, how did you choose where to go to college? Well, in, it, in the British system, you, you throw out, um, you have to, you know, give a few places that you think you might want to go, and it's a clearinghouse scheme, and I ended up at Imperial College in London. Uh, and the subject, and in, in Britain, you actually choose your major before you go, which I think is a very bad idea, and I, I think the U.S. approach is much better. Uh, it's a bad idea because kids just have no idea before they go to university about anything, or most kids, and I was certainly no exception. I chose chemical engineering for my major mainly because it seemed like the, the, the major that would cut off fewest options. Um, going, I mean, I don't know why I thought that. I'm not sure that it's any different from any other engineering field. Or how you learned about it. it it's not it, a I, topic that, that well, one I kind hears of like a lot chemis about. I like chemistry, and oh. I knew I 
engineering seemed like a good thing to do and practical and and um, and you had that background interest in, in nuclear but, control but I had no I mean that wasn't that wasn't an option in in the UK I mean you couldn't major in nuclear anything at that yeah. in the UK so it was a you know almost a random thing and as it so often is where and how did you decide oh I'm going to go to the United States and do my graduate work? Well, it's interesting. I, I, uh, Imperial College is, is, is quite like MIT in the sense that it's a college of science and technology. In fact, in those days it was even more science and technology oriented. But as an undergraduate you had to have one humanities subject. And uh, I took a, a humanities subject from a man who had previously taught at MIT. <laughs> Amazingly, I mean, and so this was a humanity. This was a historian. Do you remember his name? His name was Sinclair Goodlad, and I don't know what his position had been at MIT, but he said to me, while I was, you know, as we were talking, as I was taking this course, which I really enjoyed. You know, you really ought to think about going to MIT, <laughs> and I had no means of getting to MIT uh, financially. Um, but there was a a, a, um, a fellowship program uh, called the Kennedy Scholars Program, which actually had been set up as the British National Memorial to JFK um, in the in the 60s that sent 12 people or 10 or 12 people a year to Harvard and MIT. Um, and I think even, I think that Goodlad might even have pointed me in that direction. Anyway, I applied for it and, and was awarded this scholarship which enabled me to come to MIT as a graduate student. And that's how I ended up here. And you knew by then that you wanted to focus on nuclear? Nuclear, yes. Yeah. What were yeah. your first impressions of MIT? You got here and thought? What? I mean, I, I felt, I, it's hard to remember exactly, <laughs> um, I mean, I was completely taken aback by the, by the range of activities at MIT. I mean, it was, you know, kid in a candy store sort of uh, impression. I mean, I was also taken aback by the pace of work and, you know, that was something I had to get used to. Um, but it was really so exciting. I mean, there were so many people doing extraordinary things, and um, it was just incredibly stimulating. That was my overwhelming impression. Do you have any recollection of whether your fellow graduate students shared any of this sense of wonderment and reached out as you did, or whether you were somewhat unusual in that respect? I don't really know the answer to that question. I mean, I've certainly, it's interesting, now I'm department head of that same department I came into, I'm sort of reconnecting with some of these people who I was graduate students, you know, a graduate student with, and of course they've gone in many, many different directions. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I do remember that this was a very sort of internal thing for me at that. I mean, I, I don't remember talking to people mm -hmm. about it. It was something that, um, you know, one held sort of internally. And there wasn't a lot of socializing, as I recall it. <laughs> <laughs> in those in those uh, in those years, at least I didn't. It wasn't a very social environment. Um, it was all, in some sense, all business, so to speak. The fact that you carved out time to do these other things is interesting because I think there are professors who are very broad in their interest, and there are some who focus more narrowly on their labs and encourage their students to stay in the labs many hours, many days, and right. kind of arch an eyebrow if there's a suggestion of going off to see a concert or a play or take a course somewhere else or in a different it, it, department. And, and I gravitated within nuclear engineering toward professors who were, you know, um, had a broader view uh, of their role and the role of 
engineers and you know even of, of students. Is the department today, how does it compare to, to the one that you entered as a grad student? Well, you know, it's considerably smaller uh, because probably starting in the late 80s or early 90s, the Institute um, allowed it, let's put it that way, to, to shrink. Um, I don't think the department wanted to shrink, but it did. And it shrank in no small part because of what was happening in the nuclear power field for, you know, decades, really. Um, so the department's a smaller place. Um, until very recently, it was an older place because the department wasn't allowed to hire young faculty uh, for much of that period, and the faculty, you know, got, got older. Um, that's changed even within the last, since, I mean, I became department head last fall, but was chairing the search committee for the previous two years, and we have hired five new um, junior faculty within just the last two years, and it's a, that's a, I mean, it's a, it's tremendous. I mean, we have a lot of energy now coming from our young, young faculty. Is there a resurgence in student interest and in funding that, that is permitting you to do this? There is a resurgence in, in student interest. I mean, it, it really dipped down uh, quite steeply in the, in the 1990s, the late 1990s. But since the beginning of the, of the 2000s, um, I looked recently at the numbers. In fact, uh, for the last many, many years I was running the admissions um, committee in the, de in the department and our, um, the number of applications, the number of applicants for the department, to the department from the U.S. has increased by a factor of four over the last uh, ten years. On um, what kind of base? It's, a, it's starting from a low base, so uh, because it really was uh, down I don't remember what the numbers are, but roughly um, order of magnitude. What are we talking? I about? mean, we take we take roughly um, twenty-five to thirty new graduate students um, a year, something like that. Maybe um, in some of those years, it was probably as low as twenty. But at this point. Um, we're probably seeing about 200 applicants from both domestic and, and foreign sources, overseas sources. But, uh, you know, it, if we take both domestic and international students, I would guess that we were down uh, as low as maybe 70 or 80. Um, so there's been a lot of growth in applicants. But much of the growth, interestingly, has come from domestic, the domestic side. Now, one reason for that, of course, is the changing fortunes of the, or some expectations that the fortunes of the nuclear energy industry um, will improve. But the department is not just about nuclear power, or at least it's not just about nuclear fission. It's um, an, a large section of the department's faculty and students work on nuclear fusion and plasma physics problems related to nuclear fusion. We have uh, one of the biggest um, fusion labs in the country at MIT, uh, the Plasma Science and Fus Fusion Center on Albany Street. Uh, and then uh, the department has always had quite a lot of activity in non-energy applications of nuclear science and, and technology, and so from you know PET scanning and more recently quantum computing and um, uh, uses of neutrons as scientific um, tools to investigate materials and things of that kind. So.
While the department is very closely identified with the nuclear power industry, there's always been, um, you know, important parts of it that are not engaged with nuclear power particularly. Let's see. Do you have a particular agenda for the department at this point? Does a plan of any kind? One of my first tasks on becoming department head last September was to develop um, a strategy for the department. I felt that it needed one, and in fact, I knew that it needed one because if we were going to be allowed to grow, we had to have a compelling story for uh, why we should grow um, and how we should grow. So for the last several months um, I've been working with the faculty and working the faculty uh, <laughs> to get um, a, strategic, a strategic plan and um, we, we now I think have a uh, a direction, a pretty clear direction for growth um, that is something of a departure from where we have been uh, as a department, but I think uh, is responsive to both the prospect of a real expansion in nuclear power worth worldwide but also responsive to developments in the science and engineering um, of nuclear phenomena that are opening up a whole set of new opportunities that may in the end not have a great deal to do with nuclear power, but that really are no less at the core of our department than, than, the, energy, than the energy application. So I think we're uh, looking ahead with some real um, excitement and optimism, um, which is different from what the department has had to be dealing with over the last couple of decades. What do you see as, as the prospect for, for the use of nuclear energy and, and power in the U.S. Uh, at this point? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's an uncertain prospect. Um, globally, uh, there's no doubt that we're going to see um, major growth in nuclear in nuclear power. I mean, we're seeing most spectacularly in China um, uh, rapid increases in, in in construction of nuclear power plants. It should be said, however, that um, However fast they're moving on the nuclear power front, they're moving much faster, unfortunately, on building coal-fired <laughs> power plants. Um, but that said, they're uh, moving, moving, I mean, I think they have, at this point, 25 plants under construction, a plan to have 70 or so in operation by the end of this decade. Koreans, Taiwanese. Nuclear plants. Nuclear plants. Mm -hmm. So globally, we're going, there are probably 20 countries that are seriously considering uh, getting into the nuclear uh, power business for the first time. Some of them maybe not the ones that we would necessarily feel entirely comfortable about. Um, but so globally the picture is one of growth. Um, in the US it's I think still uh, uncertain. Um, there's no doubt at all that if we're to have any chance of meeting these very ambitious goals for carbon emission reduction that the President and some members of Congress are calling for based on the research um, and studies of the, of the climate change scientists, which despite the flurry that we've had over the last several months, continues to or continue to show that uh, we, unless we achieve very deep reductions in carbon emissions, um, we're looking at the possibility of very serious damage. There's no question that if we're to achieve these, these goals that the President and the Congress have, are setting, uh, 
we need a lot more nuclear power in this country. But the conditions that will make it possible are, are not yet there, I would say. And, and so um, whether it happens or not, um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a question. I hope it does, but I'm... Those conditions being... The conditions, I think, that, or the obstacles mainly at this point have to do with um, the, the sub very substantial financial risks that um, would face any electric power company that was considering, and there are, of course, quite a few now that are considering building nuclear plants, but the risks are very, very high. And unless we have a way of reducing those risks and enabling them to build plants that don't cost as much and can be built more quickly, I mean, it's all about reducing costs and reducing cycle times. That's the, the goal for, um, for the nuclear, that should be the goal for the nuclear power industry. In an op-ed article in the Boston Globe just before the presidential elections in 2008, you noted that both candidates for president had expressed support for nuclear power, but that even a major expansion in nuclear power would not reduce our dependence on oil imports for decades. Why would it take so long? Well, uh, when we're talking about oil uh, import reductions, uh, you know, most of the oil that we use is, of course, used in the transportation sector. And the possibilities of displacing um, oil or other fluid fuels with electricity, in the, which is the only way, really, that nuclear power, at least for the foreseeable future, can contribute to reducing consumption and uh, oil imports, um, uh, you know, that's going to take a long time. So it's um, not just a question of whether we build more nuclear power plants. It's a question of whether we shift <coughs> to using electric cars to exactly. plug in or to electric plug in trucks or, full, or, or, full elec or full electric. Now, you know, the, the, the other main uh, gain from an increase in, in nuclear power in this country uh, would be to displace the uh, coal plants that now are responsible for about 50 percent of our electricity and which of course are a major major contribution to co our carbon emissions uh, in, in this country and and so so that displacement the displacement of the coal fossil fuels um, is something that can happen directly by building a, a, a new more nuclear plants <coughs> but but over the longer term, uh, if we're going to reduce our oil consumption or oil import dependence, we're going to have to have electrification of the automobile fleet, and that will take time. It all will take time. It all will take time. The problem is we don't have a lot of time because unless we have, unless we've uh, we've decoupled um, the very close link between economic growth. Uh, and fossil or carbon dioxide emissions that you know has been a characteristic of our economy for a hundred years, unless we've figured out a way to, to decouple those two things by mid-century, it's almost certainly going to be too late in terms of avoiding serious climate damage. You talk about the risks to companies in, in moving in this direction being one of the big obstacles. Risks that come from political shutdowns or, or from plants having problems, or what are, well, what are the real risks? Political risks are certainly an important part of, of the story. Um, uh, but they're not the only risks that companies have to think about. I mean, the political risks specifically have to do with um, the difficulty that the federal government has in handling or managing the nuclear waste uh, issue, which the feds are responsible for, and which companies need to have taken care of. And there are political risks uh, associated with, you know, the licensing process and so on. But the fact is, these are multi-billion dollar projects carried out by companies whose assets may be uh, 
a very you know maybe less than the the cost of the of the new uh, whose existing assets may be less than the cost of the new of a new nuclear plant. These plants probably exceed the financial capabilities of the majority of um, electric power companies in the, in the U.S. So we either we can either make these companies bigger, or we can make the plants smaller. And probably we're going to have to do a bit of both in order to overcome this risk problem. You've also noted that the technologies being used for nuclear waste disposal um, are 25 years old, and and that it's time for or long past time, I think you've said, for a broad-based, high-quality scientific and engineering program to develop new approaches. Is that something that MIT or your department could do? And is anybody doing that? I think we can certainly contribute. You know, one of the worst things that the Congress has done, um, and its performance in the area of nuclear waste has been miserable, and I don't think that's too strong a word for decades. But one of the worst things it did was essentially to freeze any innovative thinking in this problem or on this problem uh, back in the 1980s when it um, said not only that Yucca Mountain in Nevada was going to be the, uh, the only place we, we looked at for disposal of nuclear, high-level nuclear waste, but it also said the federal government was not to spend any money on any other, uh, the exploration of any other uh, alternative for disposing of nuclear. So for 25 years, we've had no innovation in this area. Now Yucca Mountain has been taken off the table for political reasons. Uh, the government has established a commission um, to explore the future of nuclear power. One of our colleagues, uh, Ernie Moniz, is a member of that commission. It will say something in, in a couple of years. But really, it is time for a serious new um, research, serious research program to explore alternatives. We know so much more today uh, about um, the geoscience of nuclear waste disposal and the geotechnical aspects of nuclear waste disposal than we did 30 years ago when we were making these decisions. And we can contribute in this department, but also other departments at MIT can and, and are collaborating with us on, on these problems. If there are countries like China that are betting in a much bigger way on nuclear power, are they also conducting research in terms of how to deliver it uh, more safely and more efficiently, whatever, how to s store nuclear wastes better? In other words, even if the U.S. isn't doing this research, is it happening around the world? It's happening around the world, and, and every country that's generating nuclear waste um, is, is, you know, having to deal with this, um, with this issue. Uh, but different countries uh, obviously have different geologic endowments, different population densities, um, different uh, distributions of nuclear power plants. So. Uh, while there's opportunity for international collaboration in this area, um, I think that we in the U.S. certainly shouldn't and um, and can't rely on other countries to solve to solve this this problem for us. And in fact, it would be frankly embarrassing for the U.S. to uh, to to do that. So we we really need to be at the forefront of, of these activities, and there's really no reason why we, we, we shouldn't be. Do you see any other universities around the world with nuclear engineering departments or even research centers that are doing that kind of research that you think are particularly interesting? You, you know, I think one of the, one of the important elements of of our strategy in the Nuclear Science and Engineering Department at MIT uh, is to establish new research collaborations and educational collaborations with universities around the world. Because um, 
there are uh, growing capabilities um, in Asia uh, and in also in some countries in Europe that backed out of nuclear power but are now getting more involved in it again as they see the writing on the wall for climate change. And if we're to remain at the forefront of research and education in nuclear science and engineering, we need to be collaborating with the best institutions around the world uh, and also leading firms around the world. So yes, we are we already have um, a set of collaborations. We need to build new ones, especially, I think, in China, which is going to come what may be the center of nuclear development, nuclear energy development over the next um, uh, couple of decades. We have relationships with uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing, and we will extend and we will extend them. I mean, we. We have a number of students coming every year from, from Tsinghua, some this very, very department. good students, our mm -hmm. department, mm -hmm. and um, that's been the case for 15, 20 years, and we need to look for ways to make the uh, flows, as I said earlier, a little bit more symmetrical. Richard, thank you very much for talking with us today. Good luck on that front and others, and uh, this was fun. My pleasure. I enjoyed it a lot.